Well, I'm excited to to uh, thank you, uh, Shannon, uh, for Shannon Conk is a, a uh, she's been involved in uh, environmental education and sustainability for a good part of her career, and uh, has been a number of years now at uh, this Ramsey Washington Recycling Center, and was kind enough to say that she'd be willing to share some information about that with us tonight. So, Shannon. Would you take it from here, please? Yeah, absolutely. So just checking again, y'all can hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you for that introduction, Doug. Um, yeah, my name's Shannon Conk. I, like, like Doug said, work at Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy. I've been here for a little more than three years. And one of my, one of my main roles is um, you know, community engagement and education, but also the tours that we do at the facility. So I kind of feel like there's a lot of folks in our organization that know way more about specific things than I do. Um, but I kind of feel like I know a little about a lot of different things. So um, hopefully I'll be able to share kind of a, a broad, um, you know, a broad painting of the information uh, around r and &E tonight, and then um, happy to answer any questions. And then if you have any questions that I, I can't speak to, I can certainly connect folks to someone who would be able to, to get that answer. So, um, and, and like Doug said, I, I prepared slides for about 45 minutes. I don't wanna, I know it's kind of a long time to sit, so I don't want to, uh, to get too carried away with my slides, but, um, and then plenty of time for questions. Um, and then, and then, yeah, just one last reminder. I can't, I can't see anything except for my own slides. So I'm um, just holler if there's any questions or if, you know, technology is getting weird. So, all right, let's just jump in here. Um, so the grounding question I have for us tonight is where do things go when we throw them away? Um, you know, I think before working in my position, um, and I think a lot of folks, right, like we throw something away or recycle, you know, we recycle something and we put that in our curbside cart uh, or in the dumpster, like in an apartment um, or at a library, a business, whatever it might be. And as soon as we've made that decision, we really, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, right? We don't, most of us um, don't really think that much about what happens after that action. Um, so if there's one thing that I hope folks kind of take away um, from this presentation. It's just a better understanding of what actually happens when we throw things away. And then additionally, kind of what are, um, you know, what are the things that we as individuals can do? What are the things that um, our local government can do, that the businesses around us can do, that we can do in our communities uh, to, to really just help minimize the waste that uh, we produce. Okay. And then, yeah, if you ever come for a tour, which I'll, I'll really push that on you all later. But if you come for a tour, you'll see some of these cute little characters. Um, we uh, are really trying to make our tour um, cater to all ages and interests, but especially um, our elementary, middle school uh, students in the two counties, um, just because kids, you know, and hopefully some of us too have a malleable mind. Um, we'll take this information home, tell their parents about it and start some of those lifelong behaviors, so. Okay, so some of the just nuts and bolts about uh, Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy, which you just heard me say that, it's kind of a mouthful. So moving forward, I'll just say R&E. Um, so the structure of R&E, it's kind of an interesting or a unique structure. It's a joint powers public entity of both Ramsey and Washington counties. Um, so we are governed by a, a, a board member, or sorry, a board consisting of um, nine county commissioners, five from Ramsey and four from Washington. So that's kind of who, you know, that's our, our some of our highest leadership. Um, we have our r and &E center. We have the physical r and &E center, which is a waste processing facility. Um, we have our programs, which we refer to those as joint activities. I'll talk more about those later, but those are, you know, a lot of the different things we do to help residents and businesses be able to 
um, recycle more, do food scraps collection, just minimize the amount of waste that um, we're all throwing away. Um, and then operations, we have that waste processing facility, but it's a really, you know, it's an active facility. We have about 70 union staff that work at the facility right now. Um, and we'll, we'll be adding more as our programs kind of expand. So that's kind of, you know, the nuts and bolts of what r and &E is. Um, and then our vision, vibrant, healthy communities without waste. Um, and then mission, enhancing public health and the environment by creating value from waste through partnership. Um, and I will say, you know, the Metro counties generally um, compared to other, uh, other areas that you see um, across the country, there's a really strong environmental health lens um, on the way that we think about waste management. So it's kind of cool to be um, in a space where we're given the options to really uh, consider environmental health impacts and um, be so, I would say, aggressive in in the programming and the facilities operations that we have. Okay, so if you were on earlier, Doug kind of asked a little question about this. Um, so you may have heard one or two of these facts already, but uh, the two counties have actually worked together since the 1980s to manage waste responsibly. Um, so it's a long-standing partnership between Ramsey and Washington County. Um, Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy, like I mentioned, is that joint powers authority. Um, so uh, just again, the two counties working together. Um, something that is unique about the two counties is a waste designation policy. And some of you all might know what this is, um, but it's essentially by law, uh, all waste created in the two counties has to come to our facility, to the RE facility to be processed. So it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who your hauler is. It doesn't matter uh, where in the two counties you are, um, commercial, residential. The only exceptions to that are some really specific types of waste, like construction waste, um, you know, hazardous me medical waste, but everything else, like the bulk, everything you and I have been in either of these two counties have thrown away has come to our facility. Um, <clears throat> We are between the two counties, we're serving around 810,000 residents and 70,000 businesses. Um, that's 14% of the state's population. And we have a pretty diverse set of demographics between the two counties. Uh, Ramsey County is the state's most racially diverse county. Um, we have in both counties, we have a lot of different spoken languages at home. Um, and then, when you think about you know programs and services for our residents and our businesses something else that's pretty unique is the urban suburban rural dynamics right so if you're thinking about uh you know the hauling of recyclables um the equation that you use right like in a you know in a dense part of saint paul looks different than what you might use out in a uh, more rural area. So it's just, you know, kind of thinking about some of those different barriers and opportunities for our residents. Okay, so principles and priorities that we are, um, you know, using to, um, as a foundation for our work, um, we want to be planning on a 20 to 30 year horizon. So we're not just thinking about next year or a couple of years from now. Um, we really want to be looking pretty far out. Uh, and it's interesting because the, the food scrap pickup program, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, is something that's just hitting the ground running now. Uh, but that's something I know has been in the in the works planning wise for over a decade. So, um, you know, it just takes a long time to plan these larger programs. And um, so, yeah, we want to be looking out, you know, long term on that 30 year horizon. Uh, assuring flexibility and managing risk. Uh, the two counties, like I said in the last slide, 14% uh, of the state's waste. So that's a lot. It's just a lot of volume of waste. Um, and we need to be able to make sure that our system is flexible enough um, to, you know, if there's some sort of issue to be able to uh, still, you know, still operate. 
Um, and then managing risk as well, right? We don't want to get ourselves in a place where we have to um, resort to practices that don't align with our environmental health lens. Um, and so a lot of that is just, you know, making sure we have as many options as we can, thinking ahead with that longer horizon. Um, and then pivoting the view from waste to resources. So we'll talk about the waste stream here in a minute, but really thinking about we get this huge volume of waste at our facility. Um, it's 400 to 450,000 tons every year. Um, and we know in that waste stream, there are a lot of materials that in our minds aren't necessarily trash, right? There's a lot of resources within that waste stream, whether it's recyclables, whether it's food scraps, whether it's something that could have been repaired or isn't even trash in the first place. Um, so we really like to think about the waste stream, what we're, we're you know, receiving as resources that we can potentially kind of move up um, this hierarchy on the right. Um, some of you may be familiar with this Minnesota waste hierarchy, but I would say for R&E and in the, the two counties, you know, the staff of the two counties we work with, this is, if you could sort of distill our work into one image, it would be this. So we are really trying to minimize the amount of waste that we landfill and the amount of waste that we um, send to waste to energy facilities. We're trying to move waste up this hierarchy. Um, you know, the best thing, we all know the best thing we can do is to just not create that waste in the first place. Um, but then, you know, reuse, repair, recycling, whether that's traditional paper, glass, cardboard, all that, or whether it's food scraps. Um, and then the, the other thing I like to just kind of mention when we're talking about this hierarchy, um, you know, landfilling, waste energy, like I said, neither, neither is great, right? They both have... Uh, they both have some some issues. Um, waste to energy is environmentally preferred, um, although again, not perfect by any means. Um, there's another reason too that the two counties really want to minimize landfilling, and that's um, some of you may be familiar with this. The the legacy of landfills in Washington County um, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, there's a couple of landfills near the Lake Elmo area that ended up contaminating groundwater and uh, the soil there. And those ended up being super fun sites for, you know, not only environmentally harmful, um, can be harmful to, to folks that live in that area or drinking that water, but also just very expensive to manage. Um, so there's definitely a, um, you know, there's this additional reason why people are pretty anti-landfills um, in, in the two counties. Okay, so what is the waste stream? I know I, I referred to it in the past slide, um, but a waste stream essentially refers to the flow of waste. So um, you can think about everything that you're throwing away at home, um, at a business, in schools, um, at parks, at the libraries, everywhere. Um, you know, that we're throwing trash away, that ends up kind of in what you can consider a stream. And this uh, graphic to the right, that's not, this is just an example. It's not our waste stream of the two counties, although it is some similar, um, you know, we have a high percentage of organics in our waste stream. We have a lot of paper and cardboard in our waste stream. Um, but just as, a, as an example of kind of like what that waste stream looks like. So, uh, the way we kind of use this metaphor, the waste stream, is we can think about uh, options for upstream management and options for downstream management. So upstream uh, management is something that we can do or programs or behaviors before an item is actually thrown away. So that's you know an individual action or behavior, um, an opportunity, like if I you know if I have a glass mason jar that my salsa came in, um, I can rinse that out. I can reuse it again for maybe I'm canning my own salsa. I could recycle it. Um, there's a couple of things I can do upstream to prevent that from going into the trash and, you know, becoming a downstream issue. Um, downstream is after that item is discarded. So basically that's everything that we're getting at our facility. Um, 
and we we are you know we're forced to be kind of reactive to what we see in our waste stream um, and really figure out um, how we can move move that waste up the hierarchy but try to really be proactive in our programs that are um, out there for residents and and businesses so effective waste stream we need both of those right ideally and our facility manager would say this which would mean like a lot of us wouldn't have jobs but ideally we wouldn't get any waste at our facility right like if we're doing perf you know really really good programming and education if we could do that as perfectly as possible uh, you know we just wouldn't really be making trash which would be pretty beautiful um but alas we we have a lot of it um okay so this is a inf so actually if you come to the facility this is a huge magnetic board that we have <clears throat> up against a wall and i use it with i use it with both you know groups that are kids so you know like middle school groups or adult groups um to kind of talk about what the individual role is in uh waste management right and so i kind of ask people to think about like okay what's the last thing you bought what's the last thing you throw away because as you know i think as environmentally conscious as we are we can try to minimize our our waste that we're creating but we're all still kind of consuming items and at a certain point we decide we're done with an item um, and that can mean a lot of different things right so like the example I use with kids when they come in is if I'm wearing like a button up shirt like this, I'll say, OK, I had a I had a huge growth spurt over summer and now I don't fit into this anymore. So I'm done with it. That means it's trash. Right. And they're like, no. Uh, and I'm like, well, what do you do with it? And they you know, they have all the ideas that you probably have, which is you can give it away. You could sell it. You can give it away and sell it. Those are you know, those are the main two things. Um, if then I ask them, well, what if a button breaks? Right that then it's trash right and they say no you, you fix it right um so really trying to prioritize these uh, light green options at the bottom the repair the donate repurpose um as like if i'm done with something is it truly trash or can it be fixed or repurposed reused um and then obviously with recycling with food scraps those are pretty distinguishable just the distinguishable categories where we know, you know, I'm going to put my metal in the recycling bin. I'm not going to put that in compost. It's not hazardous waste, right? I think most of us are familiar with those two streams of materials. Something I like to point out with those traditional recyclables and food scraps is if you follow, you know, if you follow the arrows on the graphic, you can see they come back to the beginning. Um, so it's a, you know, it's an example of a a circular economy or circular processes where those materials can be used over and over again, as opposed to, you know, if it's an aluminum can that I'm recycling, obviously, if I recycle it, then that metal doesn't have to be extracted from the ground at a different point, right? Um, so pointing out the circularity of that. And then if something that I'm done with can't fit into any of those categories, it's probably trash. Um, and the only caveat I mentioned with trash is you know there's certain types of waste that we that have a specific place they should go right so we'll get propane tanks that people have put in black bags which is super dangerous for our facility and for our workers um you know anything with a lithium battery those can and do cause fires in facilities like ours uh household cleaners bleach paint you know a lot of those things that um just are problematic both for the environment and for our staff if they come through our facility. Um, so those should go to a, you know, one of the county environmental centers or, or a different drop off site. And then, um, you know, every everything else that's trash, uh, truly trash comes to our facility um, and we deal with it there. And we'll talk a little bit about that in two more slides. So. The other thing I just want to talk about briefly is upstream programs. So we talked about downstream, or sorry, we talked about upstream kind of like individual actions, like what I can do. Um, we also have upstream programs at RE, um, which we call our joint activities programs. Um, if you've heard of RE, it's maybe, or unless you know, you all are pretty savvy with sustainability or energy, but for 
the average person, if they've heard of r and &E, it's probably our biz recycling program. Um, that is technical assistance and grants uh, for businesses, for multi-units, for institutions to better, to, you know, sort of improve their waste best practices. So it might be starting an organics collection program at their restaurant. It might be, um, you know, like a restaurant that wants to switch from plastic silverware and paper plates to, you know, those durable silverware, real plates, um, we would, the grant could cover a dishwasher and all of the cutlery. Um, and then we actually launched recently a waste reduction innovation grant, which uh, businesses can apply to up to $50,000. And that's really like a source reduction. Um, so an example would be like a business that uses a lot of pallets. Um, instead of just those wooden pallets that you use maybe once or twice, they break, they just go into wood waste. Um, there are more durable pallets that you can use over and over and over again. Um, so there's, there are a lot of solutions out there for businesses, but it can just be hard to get that upfront money. So that's what biz does. Um, I won't read through all of these. Uh, if you have questions, let me know afterwards or feel free to email me. But the other big one is our food scraps pickup program. Um, that is going to be available to all residents in our two counties in the next two years. So moving forward, that will really be our most public facing program. Um, so, yeah. Lots of good, lots of exciting things happening. And then just in terms of outreach and education, if you're in one of the two counties, you may have seen some of these billboard ads um, or you probably, you know, if you live in the, one of the two counties, you'll receive the the recycling guide that you get each year, which has information about, you know, everything from recycling to food scraps to hazardous waste. Um, and then, you know, just some examples of campaigns that we've done. So just awareness around batteries, um, awareness around food waste. Um, and then I threw a little picture down there. So folks doing a tour because I'm always, always pushing the tours. Okay, so now to kind of just touch on the actual facility that we, that we're running. So I'll refer to it as the r &E Center. Um, located in Newport, Minnesota. Uh, Newport's, you know, some of you may have been through, driven through, um, it's pretty small and, and you usually don't end up finding yourself there unless you're like visiting someone that lives there, but otherwise it's pretty small and it's in a more industrial area. Uh, we are technically, in Washington County, or right kind of on the, the boundary of Washington, Ramsey, and Dakota counties. Um, so right right in the middle there. Uh, you can see from this aerial photo that we are right on the Mississippi River too. So um, you know we see the we see the local environment every day. Um, we go to work. We actually get quite a few uh, birds of prey in the area, which is which is cool. <laughs> and also weird because you're at like a waste processing facility, but you know, industry and environment, they aren't separate. Uh, so the facility, uh, actually I'm gonna jump back. So you can see there's uh, been some additions to our facility. So this main section here and then behind it, that is all original since 1989, 88, 89. Um, and then we've had a couple of additions to um, kind of support some of our newer work, including the food scrap pickup program. Um, so 1989 to 2015, the facility was actually privately owned and operated. So if you've been around the county for a bit, you may have passed through, or even you may, as a resident, you can bring waste to drop off. So maybe you've even, even been before. Um, but yeah, privately owned and operated until 2015 when the two counties purchased the facility uh, together. And then, like I said, because of that waste designation policy, all trash from residents and businesses by law has to come to our facility. Um, and then I'm going to actually share a clip. Uh, it's in our About r and &E video. Um, just to kind of explain what happens in the facility. I could I could talk through it, but this video does a much better job at, you know, actually showing what happens in the facility. So I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second and switch over. Give me 
30 seconds to make this, to make this switch. Okay. We tested the audio earlier, um, so it should be good, but just holler if it's not working. And will someone just confirm visually if you're seeing the full screen? There's there's nothing else besides yeah. the, the clip? Okay, We're just seeing the facility. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm going to hit start here, and then it's a couple minutes, and then we'll be back on in right after that. RE runs the Ramsey Washington Recycling and Energy Center, or RE Center, in Newport, Minnesota. If you live in Ramsey or Washington County, your trash comes right here to the RE Center. Over 400,000 tons of trash are delivered here each year, enough to fill Orleans soccer field 19 times. RE uses cutting edge equipment to sort through all the trash and pull out valuable stuff like metals for recycling and turns what's left into fuel to make electricity. Here's how it works. First, garbage trucks like the ones that come to your home and school dump trash onto the tipping floor. It's the size of a football field. Front loaders like this push trash over to two cranes that lift it onto moving conveyor belts, which move the trash into our system to be processed. Crane operators watch out for dangerous stuff like propane tanks, which shouldn't be thrown in the trash, and things that are too big to go through the system. In the control room, the operator watches 31 live video feeds for any signs of trouble. If they see something dangerous, they can shut down the whole system with a click of a button. After the tipping floor, the first stop is the hammer mill. In this section, 24 big hammers weighing 145 pounds each spin and break open trash bags and smash the trash into small pieces. When they're small enough, the trash falls through holes in the floor onto another conveyor belt. As the trash moves along, a big magnet pulls out all the magnetic metals, like soup cans, and drops them on a different conveyor. All of this metal gets packed up and sent to a recycler to be melted and turned into new products. Back to the other conveyor belt. Trash that the magnet left behind passes over what's called the disc screen. Heavy things like glass, rocks, and other grit fall through the holes while lighter materials pass over the top and are blown off the disc screen using a large fan called an air classifier. So the magnetic metal, glass, rocks, and other grit have all been pulled out, but aluminum, another type of valuable recyclable, isn't magnetic. So we need the next piece of machinery to sort things out, like pop cans. The trash that's left passes through an electromagnetic current called an eddy current. Non-magnetic metal items, like pop cans, are repelled by the electromagnetic current and are pushed to another belt, where they are packaged and sent to a recycler to be melted and reused. On average, 80,000 pounds of aluminum cans are pulled out of the trash every week at the r &E Center, which is equivalent to the weight of seven elephants. That's a lot of cans. We all need to do our part and make sure materials are recycled at home or school instead of going in the trash. They are cleaner and easier to recycle this way. Next, the trash goes through a second hammer mill with 36 big hammers spinning 900 times per minute and breaking it into even smaller pieces than the first hammer mill. When it's shredded like this, the trash is fluffy and light. This is called refuse-derived fuel, or RDF. The RDF is loaded on trailers and sent to XL power plants in Red Wing and Mankato, where they use it to make electricity. r &E sends about 75 trailers of RDF to XL power plants every day. 
On average, the RE Center produces enough fuel to power 12,500 homes per year. By keeping trash out of landfills, the RE Center prevents almost 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. That's like taking over 21,000 cars off the road every year. This is important in addressing climate change. R okay. I'm going to stop sharing that screen and switch back to the PowerPoint. Okay, are we are we back? Yep, you're good. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so this is uh, an infographic basically of what they just explained, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to kind of mention is just what of what we receive and then what we are sending out, about 83% of what we are, are sending out is that refuse-derived fuel. 14% uh, approximately, you know, this varies a little bit year to year. 14% is heading to landfill and we send our waste to the Pine Bend landfill in Dakota County. So it's just down the river from us. And then about 3% is recycled and that is all just metals for now. Um, so that's kind of the, just the breakdown of, of where all of that is actually, uh, you know, what that ends up as. Okay. So what you know was just explained in the video and then that infographic that's kind of been the bread and butter of the facility since the late 80s um but you know the the video did provide uh so some of the benefits of waste energy relative to landfilling we also know that there are, are better things we can do with our waste you know especially just moving waste up that hierarchy so um some exciting things that we have um, coming to the RE Center, or that we already have. Um, two, two really big ones right now. So the first is a uh, recyclable recovery system line. So that RRS line, I'll refer to it um, as, can pull plastics, cardboards, additional metals, and then really interestingly, can also pull organic rich fraction. So we know that in our waste stream, there's about 20% um, of what is in there is organic. So mostly food scraps. Um, and we actually are going to be able to, with this new line, collect um, a two inch minus fraction of materials that is really highly um, rich in organics. So you'll have basically a screen and what's dropping through there, anything smaller than two inches. There's gonna be plastics, there's gonna be other small bits of things, but there's a lot of organics in that part of the waste stream. And we actually are going to be able to take that and put it through anaerobic digestion. Um, so, you know, the end product of that organic rich material going through anaerobic digestion, will be able to extract the energy from that. And then obviously what you'll have less left physically is not, not like a nutrient rich compost. There's some of that in there, but it's going to be contaminated with other things as well. So I believe we're going to be doing a biochar process with that, but it'll be exciting that, you know, just even in this waste stream, we can collect some of those food scraps and, and run that through AD. Um, and then the second really big addition um, and exciting program that we have at the facility um, and in the two counties is the food scrap pickup program. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that here in the next couple slides. Um, but then generally just wanting to, you know, we're, we're always trying to figure out uh, how we can better manage waste, um, whether that's what we do with it at our facility um, or how we, how we communicate to residents and to businesses, what sort of programs we're offering, how to 
um, really help remove those barriers to um, push waste up that hierarchy. So how do we make waste reduction easier? How do we make um, repair and reuse? Um, some of the, like a fix-it clinic is an example of some of the programming that we um, help with um, and that the two counties have. So, um, you know, we have, we have some cool things at our facility, but we really still are trying to focus on those upstream uh, waste prevention practices. Okay, so a couple of slides about the food scrap pickup program. Um, just because, like I said earlier, this is really going to be, of, of all the programming we do, this is going to be the most public facing. And hopefully, you know, I assume some of the folks on this call are living in one of the two counties, and hopefully some of you will participate in this program. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks already do the drop-off sites or might have a garden, so they do backyard composting. Um, so we do have, you know, we do have folks in the two counties that are already doing that. But the food scrap pickup program should make it a lot easier for people to participate in food scraps collection. Um, I'm, I'm actually a trader and live in Minneapolis. So I have, you know, I have that cart, that green cart. I can put my food scraps directly into there. A truck comes and picks it up every week. It's pretty sweet. Um, we're doing something a little bit different in our two counties and I'll explain why. Um, but let me back up a second. So why are we doing a food scrap pickup program? I'm sure if you're on this call, kind of sustainability minded, you, you know the benefits of uh, composting. But like I said earlier, about 20% of what we're seeing on our tip floor, what we're seeing in household trash is uh, food scraps. Um, we separate this material, we can move it up that hierarchy um, instead of just having it be incinerated or landfill, landfilled, uh, reducing our emissions, um, conserving resources and really trying to push the needle up to meet that state recycling goal. We're aiming for 75% by 2030. We're hovering right around 50%. So uh, this program should help us, you know, move the needle significantly, um, which is pretty exciting. That said, with, with this new program, we still really want to, when we're talking about food waste, we still really want to prioritize food waste prevention in the first place, right? So if there's edible food, we want to make sure that um, it's getting to folks that, um, you know, that, that will eat it. Um, or we want to make sure that we're helping, you know, residents uh, just figure out how to better manage wasted food, right? Like that's something that composting is great, but we, we don't want to waste that, that food in the first place. Um, this program, the Food Scrap Pickup Program, will help manage food waste that uh, can't be prevented. So all of those inedible parts. And then certainly we all forget about like a box of leftovers in the back of the fridge or things like that. So, um, you know, all organics uh, will be able to be part of this program. So this program is pretty unique. Um, it's different than what most of us might be used to like for me with just the cart um, or maybe in other places in the country, this is actually a co-collection program. Um, so it's, uh, I'm gonna hop down to this graphic at the bottom and then come back up to the points. But basically if you're a resident in either of the two counties, what you would do to participate in this program is you go online or you can call the customer service number, uh, the order of, a year supply of bags, it's at no cost to residents. Um, you get one year supply at a time. And then, you know, you're going about your week, you're collecting your food scraps, you're putting them into these specific bags. Um, and then when the bag's full or when, you know, it's almost trash day, you're gonna tie up the bag. And then this is what kind of is a little bit different than what we're probably used to. You actually put that bag directly into your trash cart or into your uh, you know your dumpster if you're at a multi-unit and then your hauler comes they pick it up there's nothing different for them um, and then because of that waste designation policy that i mentioned earlier where all the trash by law has to come to our facility from the two counties all these food bags all these food scrap bags that are mixed in with all the other trash will be delivered to our tip floor go through our facility which um we have four robots that are designed to 
see the exact color and uh, imprint of the bag. So they actually pull the bags out of the waste stream as it's mo moving on a conveyor, which I have a clip of that I'll show in a second. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a unique uh, model for food scraps collection, different than what most people might be used to. Um, but when we looked at what makes sense, like why are we doing this co-collection system? Uh, I remember when I talked about, you know, we have Washington County, which is pretty rural. Um, when we actually looked at like what would it take to run another hauling route through both of our counties, another bin, you know, another truck on the road, it actually made environmentally a lot more sense to do this uh, co-collection model, right? So it's the same, you know, it doesn't change for the haulers. It doesn't change um, the amount of, of trucks on the road. Um, all of that part is the same because these bags are just going directly into the trash. Um, and then when we think too about an equity perspective, um, I don't know if anyone's lived in like an apartment building recently or um, is in an apartment building right now, but I know my experience has been, sometimes it's a battle enough just to get like a building manager to take recycling seriously. Um, so to be able to just call or go online and sign up for this program, have the bags mailed directly to you, it takes that barrier out of the equation, right? It doesn't matter if your building manager is pro or anti food scraps collection or not, it doesn't matter who your hauler is. It doesn't matter what part of the county you live in. If you're urban, rural, um, it's the same access for everyone. Um, and then I just want to say a couple of specific things about the bags. So people, you know, are used to using maybe the, the bags at the food scrap drop-off sites around the two counties, or maybe the ones you get like at a grocery store. And those are pretty thin, right? And so they those can tear easier, or if they get wet, they're, they're not as durable. These bags, um, and the reason why you have to, you know, order your supply through, you know, through this program is because these bags were specifically designed for this program. So they're, they're more than two times thick, uh, more than two times thicker than those ones you may have used before. Um, they're more similar to like a regular trash bag, um, but they're still BPA um, certified, biodegradable, they're PFAS free. Um, and and the other important thing about those bags, right, is the, that's what the robots are being trained to see. So that's why we kind of have to have a, a uniform bag system. Um, <clears throat> we've, done some, we've done some surveys and some focus groups with with residents that are in in the small pilot we're in and you know people people have concerns about um them breaking they just you know i think it can be a little nerve-wracking to put this compostable bag into your trash cart and just <laughs> wish it best as it goes away in a hauler but um we actually had our engineers do some testing where they put food scraps in these bags tied them up and then place them in a few different areas in the county and then measured how many made it, you know, in a single piece unbroken to our facility. And it was in the mid nineties. Um, so there'll be some loss in this, in this system, but, you know, I think that's going to be far outweighed by the fact that this is just so accessible um, and hopefully so easy to, for, for so many of our residents. Um, you don't have to drive your food scraps anywhere. Um, it's just, you know, it's all right there contained in you know, a lot of the same things you're doing to manage your waste already. Um, and then what happens at the end of, uh, you know, once we get the bags for the next few years, they will continue to go to uh, the industrial compost site that we use down in Shakopee and they use the um, windrow kind of approach. So outdoor uh, industrial compost, but I mentioned anaerobic, anaerobic digestion earlier. We are, working um, with DEMCON um, and another um, entity to have an anaerobic digestion facility that we can send our food scraps to um, within like the next, you know, probably within the next five-ish years. It all, a lot of it depends on permitting and such, um, but we will have anaerobic digestion that we're ultimately sending our food scraps to, which once 
uh, we, we have that up and running, we'll be able to extract the energy from that. Um, and then we'll also have, with the food scraps, we'll have the nutrient nutrient rich compost at the end of that AD process. So um, two, you know, usable byproducts from the anaerobic digestion process. So I'm gonna play this clip. Uh, these, this is not our facility, but these are the exact robots that we're using. Um, so you'll see they, you know, are grabbing the green bags. Obviously this is like an incredibly idealized situation. No conveyor belt at our facility looks that clean by a long shot. Um, <laughs> but you'll see in a second, they'll mix in some other waste here. And if you look to the kind of behind the robots, you'll see there's a scanner. Um, and the scanner is looking like where it's lit up. It's looking um, or scanning the conveyor and it's looking for that specific bag. And once it identifies that, it's communicating to the robotic arm kind of like when and where to pull based on the speed of the conveyor belt. So robots, they're going to take over the world um, for better or worse, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so to wrap it up, I, you know, I feel like I've been talking at you all for a while and I'm closing in on almost an hour here. Um, but some takeaways, <clears throat> even though it's, you know, you throw something away, waste is local, or throw something away, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, waste is a local issue, always, you know, whether that's where um, your recyclables go, um, where our trash goes, it might ultimately end up far away, but it has to be processed locally. And, you know, in the case of the r &E Center, um, a lot of our, our ferrous metals um, go stay here in St. Paul for processing. Our non-ferrous go to Chicago, so at least still regional. And then the, the RDF, as the video mentioned, uh, go see their Mankato or Red Wing. So both local and then our landfill is that that one right down the river in Dakota County. So waste is a local issue. Um, the RNE Center, sometimes still people people still get confused, you know, is it a waste energy facility? Is it a recycling facility? It's neither, you know, it's a waste processing facility where we do recover some recyclables that are in the trash and then we we process waste to be refuse derived fuel. Um, and then just emphasizing both those upstream and downstream efforts for for um, best waste management. And then just with the future vision and continuing to, um, you know, build on, on what we've already done and, and continue to um, just add some of the technology or in, increase the amount of outreach and education that we're doing to um, really just try to reduce the amount of waste that is created in the two counties or, you know, to get waste in the right place. So if it's food scraps, it goes to the right place, recyclables go to the right place, et cetera. And then I, th I believe this is my final slide and this will be my plug to um, come visit us and take a tour. Um, so we have two upcoming community tours. So that's like anyone, it could be just you, it could be you and a family member or a couple family members. We have one this coming Thursday at five o'clock, and then we have one November 11th, just a Saturday at one o'clock. Um, the link to sign up for those tours is at the bottom of the page here. Um, if you are in a group, like if this group, you, this group itself could, uh, you know, find a time that works for a number of people and sign up for a, a tour. Um, so I'll, I'll have different types of groups um, sign up and bring, you know, it might be like a, a Sierra Club group or a 4 H group, or um, I've had some like living co ops come. So any type of group is welcome to come um, to visit the facility. Um, and then also on our website, on that same page, on the tourist webpage, there are uh, virtual tours. So you can actually kind of jump into the jump into the facility virtually and see, um, you know, some different things within the the facility and just kind of what that the innards of the of the building looks like. So yeah, I think that's what I have for you all. Uh, if I'm going to I'm going to jump in, yeah. Shannon, 
and just share with people uh, over the years, I've taken a number of young people groups to the tipping floor. And uh, sometimes in the summer, that's not too pleasant a place to be. But anyway, uh, the kids were just absolutely blown away by what was on that tipping floor. And what I mean is, you know, there's a normal garbage and waste, but, you know, there were like bicycles that looked like they were brand new that people were throwing away. And so the kids were just totally amazed by, you know, what some people throw away. So it, it I mean, the tour is just fascinating uh, and it really can be, you know, a, a major life-changing uh, thing for some people to just really learn what uh, what's what's going in the garbage kind of thing. So piggybacking on that comment, Doug Shannon, I am a retired educator for St. Paul Schools, and I want to thank RE for allowing no cost field trips for my classes to come to your Newport facility. Because just as Doug said, young people learn that out of sight is not out of mind and they were astounded at what gets thrown out so hopefully that impacted them into adulthood so please thank arnie for these field trips yeah yeah absolutely and i, I guess I'll, that's i'm glad you mentioned that because for k-12 groups we have busing reimbursement so i know that can definitely be a barrier busing can be expensive and we want to we want to remove that barrier for students to get to the facility and see what's going on Shannon, one thing, and, and just kind of a, a joke, but not really, um, uh, can you share with people how your building is built so that if one of those propane tanks goes through the hammer mill, what what mm -hmm. can happen? I, I was just amazed when I found out about how they, how they thought about that ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I don't know the exact specs, but the way I understand it. So the hammer mills, especially, um, and, and some of that upfront, the heavy duty industrial part of the processing, it's complete. So there's no staff that are back in that area. It's behind an additional concrete wall. And um, that's kind of just like a, yeah, that's just a no-go zone for, for humans because yeah, if a propane tank runs through one of those hammer mills, it will explode. And um, it's, the equipment's pretty resilient um, it, it might knock us down for a couple hours. We might have to repair some of the hammers, but, um, you know, sometimes things seek through earlier or later or like a lithium battery, right? That's something that's tiny, um, and that can get into the system, um, and, and be really problematic. So it's, uh, yeah, it's the safety there's, is definitely there's actually a hinge. One. If I, if I remember right, there's actually, yeah, yeah, yeah please hinge hinge roof on that building where you're talking, where if something explodes, uh, those walls hold it, but then there's an escape thing going up in the air to let all that pressure out of there so it doesn't wreck the building and more people and equipment. So I, I just, I thought that was amazing that people thought far enough ahead for that. <laughs> so Shannon, do check the chat. I think you've got like four or five questions in the chat. Okay, I, I can't see it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop I'm gonna, sharing. I'm gonna then. call on Barbara Lund. She has her hand up and asking a question. So Barbara. Hi. So where is the burner that that burns the most of it? Yeah. So it's either Red Wing or Mankato where the RDF is sent. And for the most well, so part, so most of your eighty percent of your trash is hauled that far then before it's burned. Yeah. Yep. Which you know. Mankato, well, most of it is actually going to Red Wing because that's closer and they have more capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, you know, it's it it takes a journey from our facility to one of the incinerators. Um, it's interesting, though, because before this job, I didn't realize, you know, depending on your hauler, when there's no waste designation policy, you know, like a hauler might be driving their waste from the metro all the way down to Iowa. So there's a lot of emissions associated with yep. just the the transportation of yeah. of trash. Would you consider taking the trash that's now going into the Herc in Minneapolis and burning it wherever you burn the other stuff? Red Wing. Uh, I mean, I think that's a that's a question way above my pay grade. Uh, I don't know what 
the capacity is for the Mankato and Red Wing facilities or, you know, no. what the impacts of that additional burning would be because there's obviously, um, you know, th there's communities down there as well. So I'm not sure. Um, yes. That's Yeah, I think that's a... We were very question. proud of the Herc when it was first built. And as far as I know, it's still functioning well, but I heard an interview today on NPR as if we were on purpose poisoning our residents on the north side of Minneapolis. And actually, I don't know, the, you know why, the, I'm sure the whatever it comes out goes to the south side or the east side or the west side as well, but it's, um, they really do want it turned off. And what would we do with it? Yeah. I mean, I think there is, there is a disproportionate impact to the north and the northeast, just the way that, um, the way that those emissions spread out, but it's also, the Herc is situated in a really industrial area as well. So there's a lot of accumulative emissions in that area. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Herc is right. Like waste energy is controversial, no doubt about it. And for, for, you know, very good reasons. Um, something I've learned working here is just like, you know, the best thing we can do is reduce our waste. And once you get beyond that, uh, it just, the conversations start to get tricky. Thank you. Let's, let's, uh, Lewis, Asher, you want a question, please? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Very educational. I'm very happy to see what's going on. My question is, as far as the uh, food scrap bags, what size are they? And when can we start ordering them? And by the way, excellent approach to letting us put them in the trash. You know, that's a great approach. Yeah, so the sizing. Um, so there are, if you were to sign up, you would have the option to order six gallon or 13 gallon bags. The reason that, so we did some surveying and some focus group with residents and they kind of provided input on what bags they would like to use. Um, we do know that there is a preference for some smaller bags too, but unfortunately six gallons is the minimum size that um, a bag can go through that conveyor, through that processing and still be visually detected by the robotics, right? So anything too small might just get buried. So it's a, it's a depth burden issue on the conveyor. So six and 13 gallons to answer that question. And then if you go to its food scrap pick, pickup.com, is that right? I'm double checking. Yeah. So if you go to food scrap, food scraps pickup.com, and I'll just drop that right into the chat. If you go to that website, you can actually scroll down and you can, um, you can, Put in your address and see um, it, if you're coming up soon. It, it might tell you that you're eligible, or um, otherwise, it will say, you know, you can provide your email address and then it will tell you when you're about to be eligible, when your program, or sorry, when your area is about to be eligible. So the, the program is going to roll out in phases. And so it might be this year, it might be next year, you might already be eligible. Um, you'd probably know because you would have received some mailers, but. Um, yeah, let me, I'm going to drop that into the chat. Thank you very much. One of, one of the people in the chat said that they went in and put in their information and it said that they were not eligible. So it it's mm -hmm. not, not, it's not available to everybody. Is that true then? Correct. Yeah. So right now we're just in a pilot part okay. of okay. that program. So it's only about 2000 households um, that are in the pilot and it's a purposefully small pilot because we want to make sure from the equipment end on our side, we have all of our ducks in a row, the, all the machinery is operating as it should be. The, ro the robots actually have a commissioning period where we have to kind of train them. And then from the resident side, we're doing a lot of, yeah, focus group surveying of the folks that are in the pilot group to make sure, you know, just to see how's it going. So what's working well, what's not working. Are there things that we could be providing to encourage participation? Because we know we probably have one impression, you know, one shot with with this for folks. So if we what we don't want is someone to sign up for the program and it's it's not, you know, 
there's too many barriers for them or something's not working on our end. So we're getting all of our ducks in a row. And that's the reason we're doing this pilot. And then we'll roll it out in phases. So like I said, it might be, might be this year, it might be next year um, or even the year after. But uh, if you're not eligible right now, you can put your name, you can sign up to receive uh, basically alerts of when you would be eligible. Okay. Chris, do you want to go ahead with your question on lids? Unmute yourself. It's one of the questions that has come up over and over in various places I've worked and, you know, just neighbors, what to do with lids. Um, and maybe in your program, it doesn't really matter, but um, um, in Minneapolis, a, a lid can slide through a cr crack. It's too skinny, you know, and, and doesn't get sorted properly, doesn't go through that hammer or whatever. Do you, what, what's your take on that? Do you leave them on? Do you take them off? Are they trash? Yeah, so you're referring to a recyclable, like a plastic lid for on a recyclable? Yeah, like a cottage cheese okay. container. Do you yeah. leave it on or a bottle? Do you leave the cap on? Yeah, so I would, my understanding is you can leave the, you can leave the cap on. Um, you're correct that if, basically if you think of something the size of a credit card, um, it, anything smaller than that is, yeah, likely to kind of fall through those, those um, screens and not be recycled. So uh, leave lids on is my understanding, certainly with like yogurt or, you know, if it's very obvious that it's the same type of plastic for the bottom and the top. Um, I, if you are in the Twin Cities, I would look at Eureka. That's probably where your recycling is going. So I would jump onto the Eureka website. They have a lot of good information there. Um, and they actually do tours as well. So if you ever want to kind of see what's going on with your recyclables, um, yeah. It would seem like if you leave the lid on and then you put it through that hammer that it all gets separated anyway. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, what they do at a recycling facility, which is referred to as a MRF, that's a different process than what we have. So, you know, the hammer mill, the two hammer mills that we have, you know, the, the main, the reason those are there is to break things apart um, and break things into much smaller pieces so that it can be processed. Okay. Whereas right. like at a recycling, at a recycling facility or MRF, that's not necessarily the process. They're more trying to separate things out. And I just have one other question. Uh, there have been reports on the news that are just really disheartening about um, there not being a market for products that are made of recycled materials. So a lot of it just goes and becomes trash in the end anyway. And I want to know what your take of that uh, on that is. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to just like waste recycling is it's a local issue so that is certainly true in parts of the country where there's not a market for you know household recyclables so you may be trying to recycle in certain parts of the country and if there's no market for it that ultimately is going to get trashed um i will say we are lucky in the upper midwest i don't know if lucky is right well depending on how you look at it we have a strong recycling we have strong recycling markets in part because we still have some you know, manufacturing. So a lot of the recyclables that we throw or that we recycle here in the Twin Cities end up um, being used to manufacture like decking and like some of that Trex type material. Um, and I don't quote me on this, but I do believe that in, I'm not sure if it's county or state, but there are some places where there are laws that if you collect the recyclables, you have to be recycling it. Um, and in the Twin Cities, that is certainly true, right? Like I've been to Eureka myself. You see them doing the the separation. You can ask them, hey, where does your cardboard go? Where does your, where do our metals go? Like I know we pull those metals out of our waste stream. And like I said earlier, we send the aluminum cans to Chicago. We keep the Ferris here in St. Paul, but those are actually being recycled. So, but I think what you're saying brings up a really good point, which is that it's a it's there's two sides of the equation right there's the supply of the recyclables and there's the demand and if we don't have the demand whether it's for recycled materials or you know we all think we are doing you know a good job when we donate things which we are but that system only works if we're also buying donated goods or participating in the other half of that supply and demand so it's you know that's a great question and 
it's just it's something we could do like a whole nother hour on is the is yeah the, no no you're the right it's, of it. it's like yeah that's right you know just marketing um marketing recycled products you know like there's got to be a desire for it or or it's just got to be done and then people don't even know about it they don't they just buy buy stuff and don't even know that it's you know made of recycled materials and that's the way it should be it's just a, like you say the circular economy sure yeah and i think it speaks to we just have to re i mean we we can recycle all the plastics we want in the world but we probably just need to reduce the amount of plastics that we're using in the first place because there's just there's there's so much of it right that we're using all the time that even in places where there's good markets it's just there's an, there's usually there's a lot of it out there shannon does the uh, the glass does that go local here in the area um that one i'm not so sure about because it's not something that we pull out of our the waste stream at r e but that would be another good question for eureka yeah i i know they they send it to a, a plant out in Shakopee and stuff. I've also okay. heard from heard from them that they they ship, ironically, they ship a lot of paper overseas to Asian countries. They turn it back into cardboard, put their products in it, and ship it back to us, which is you know kind of a kind of a good thing. But I mean, think about the transportation costs there; it's crazy. So, uh, we've yeah, got right. another question here from Jamie. When you burn the waste, do you collect any of the products from the chemical reactions to reuse? I, that, would, that would be at, at Red Wing and stuff, I suppose, that question, huh? Yeah, that'd be for, so those are both Excel uh, facilities in Red Wing and Mankato. Yeah. So that would, I'm not quite sure. I haven't heard of that being a part of the process, but I I'm, apologize, but I'm not, uh, not sure if I've, that's I've been that to do. those plants i've been to those plants and i have not seen anything like that happening but you know they 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 burn pretty clean but there's there you yeah. know always going to be some waste just one yeah. one fun fun tidbit i and i don't know if people are anyway uh in my working with this uh, I, I I was confused, like you put all the stuff in the trucks and you move it down to Red Wing and Mankato. Well, how do you get this stuff out of the truck? You know, do you have some big thing that pushes it out or whatever? And what I found out is they have walking floors and and the, the floor actually vibrates and that <laughs> moves that material right out of the out of the out of the truck. Now the trucks are enclosed, of course, so they don't fly all over. But I, I always thought that was an interesting concept, whoever came up with walking floors for moving RDF, you know, so. Yeah, that's that's pretty smart. That's pretty smart. Yeah. I see a few more questions here in the chat that I'll try to get to. So. Sure. Uh, what is done with pet waste? Similar to, similar to diapers, it's it's in the waste stream. There's a, if you think about all the diapers and all the pet waste in the two counties, there's probably a good amount of it it's it's going to go through the processing system um you know it's probably small you know it, it depends on how much it's broken down but it would either be uh going to landfill or to uh waste to energy so yeah it's in there certainly it's a you know it's smelly it's trash <laughs> Um, and then someone else asked, do you work with landfills to remove trash from them? Do we work with landfills to remove trash from them? So correct me if I'm wrong, whoever asked this question, but I think is, is are you asking like, do we take trash that's at the landfills and bring it to our facility to be processed? Is that the question? I think that might be their intention yes, with that okay, question. That's what they said. Right. Uh, we do not. So we, um, you know, because we have that waste designation policy, if it's at the landfill, it's at least if it's coming from one of our two counties, that means we, we don't want it anyway. Right. It's like too big. It's too bulky. Um, and it might be like furniture or pallets, um, a lot of industrial waste. Um, we get a ton of like stringy plastic film that would just kind of like add 
gunk up our system a little bit. So we don't, um, we don't do that. I'll say for a more kind of tangible number on how much trash we get a day, it's, it's about 73 school buses worth of volume. So, um, by the time trash is getting to our facility, we, we are using kind of more, you know, we, we just have to, we have to push it through and we have some great operations and technologies to help pull some of those valuables out. But, um, we're not, yeah, we're certainly not, um, yeah, adding anything from from landfills. It's an interesting. One, one of one of my friends actually worked at the plant, and one of the toughest jobs I've heard of, they had to get into the hammer mills, and cut all the stuff off that gets caught in that thing during the processing. And I, mm -hmm. I just can't even imagine what what a mess that must be with all the various materials and everything. Mm -hmm. So talk yeah, that's especially. That's not as problematic at our facility. Our hammer mills are really meant to, they will break open those bags really easily. However, for recycling, that's why they really, really try to message not putting your recyclables into any sort of plastic bag because the type of machinery that they're using at a MRF at like a recycling facility, those bags will tangle, they'll wrap around kind of the rotors. And then I think at Eureka, they spend like, I think they told us an hour to a day just cleaning off plastic bags. So that's, you know, a lot of wasted downtime just because there's, you know, those bags. Yeah. Oh, well, we got time for one more question. Anybody have one final one or Shannon, do you see anything else? And I think I, I think I got through the chat, but feel free to someone holler if you put something in the chat and I'm not seeing it. Well, if not, thank you so much. A great presentation really, really helped explain what's going on. And and to me, the excitement of what you guys are going to be doing with the food waste. I mean, that's, yeah, like absolutely. like you say, that issue has been around for years and it, it's you're actually doing something about it finally, you know, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, and actually before... I'm just going to, I'm going to drop the tour webpage into the chat as well. That way, um, if you all, you know, want to form a group and, and come tour, or if individuals want to come, um, that'll just be in the chat here. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, thank you, Doug and, and everyone for, for having me and, um, I will, <laughs> I know the my email was on the last slide there, but I'm gonna also put this in the chat in case you have any follow up questions or, um, yeah, if there's anything I can if, help answer if, or clarify. Yeah, and if people have questions and you can't get a hold of Shannon, you know, feel free to get a hold of me and I will get you connected. And also, Shannon, thank you so much for taking your vacation time to to <laughs> help us out here with this. This was Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. And apologies if there's any kind of background noise that I'm at an Airbnb and don't have a complete control over my environment right now. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, a yeah. bunch of us are going to be breaking off now to join the MRES meeting. So thank you cool. again. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll talk to you along the way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sounds thank good. You thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, have a good one. Bye-bye.